do you let's let's loop in Turkey and maybe through Syria. So look again, let's just play this very objectively. Assad has won. Those forces are consolidating. What does this mean now from the perspective though of of some basically the no, basically that there would be some beginning of kind of state reformation post civil war. Now we're hit with corona. How does that play out in uh, in a Syrian context? And also, you know, U.S., Russian, Turkish, Saudi, Israeli hegemonic, uh, you know, game and Iranian game playing there. Sure, it strikes me as you know, just prior to Corona breaking out, and if you remember, you know, we had this crisis in northwestern Syria where the Syrian army went on the offensive and Turkey threatened to intervene. So I think you know, just before Corona Corona became really serious, I think most of the sort of the the Syrian conflict has been frozen, right? The Syrian regime is not going to reconquer the country, right? The United States uh, is not going to leave, you know, uh, the Kurdish zone immediately. uh, And uh, Turkey is not going to leave northwestern Syria immediately. So we're basically going to see sort of uh, what we've seen is this sort of freezing in place of of, of the conflict. Uh, And of course, with Corona, people just don't want to fight. You know, you don't want to launch a military offensive in the middle of a a pandemic. That makes no sense whatsoever. So again, I think as with a lot of things, things have been frozen in place. And of course, you know, when things get frozen in place, that creates a kind of momentum for that to sort of continue on. So I think, you know, for the foreseeable future, we'll see a rump Syrian state under Assad's rule. We'll see, you know, uh, Sort of a, a Kurdish-controlled uh, north, uh, east, uh, eastern Syria, and a sort of Turkish-backed rebels in northwestern uh, Syria, maintaining that position largely because of the sort of foreign powers' desire to sort of maintain that status quo. So, I and, think um, it, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. No, I, I mean, my, my point being is that. I think we're going into kind of this deep freeze zone of the Syrian conflict. So I think some of the most brutal fighting may have come to an end. Yeah. Uh, And what we're going to see is consolidation in each of these zones. But, you know, Corona has the ability to upend this. You know, uh, I read today, uh, you know, CBS reported that people are suspecting perhaps as many as, you know, 100,000 cases of Corona in in Idlib province in the north uh, west of Syria. So how's that going to play? You know, what kind of impact is that going to have on a society? I think, you know, people people often forget disease and its impact on history because it's not something uh, we can control necessarily. We can mitigate right. it. We can, we can make policies. But just like climate change, it has uh, an agency of its own, which we have very little... Uh, effect on you know you think about historical moments in the past where disease has played a critical role uh, uh, in, in historical change I mean just look at the impact of the Black Death or you know the Spanish influenza and how that affected uh, politics you know we don't think of it because humans uh, uh, you know like to put themselves at the center of the story but um, you know disease can have an upending effect on politics, just as environmental change. You know, we look at Syria and we we think about it in terms of sectarianism. We think about it in terms of sort of uh, uh, conflicts o- over resources. But we need to look at that also within the broad context of um, uh, of environmental change and desertification and the uh, and water wars taking place in those things. So disease and environmental change have huge impacts on these conflicts also accelerate a status quo that is already obviously with regards to the occupation of the West Bank and the, you know, strangulation of Gaza by the Israelis already is, you know, in particular in the case of Gaza, I mean, one of the worst humanitarian zones in the world. Uh, Again, this is another thing that if you get outside of the, you know, sort of strikingly narrow, almost McCarthyite debate about it in the United States, you know, David Cameron, the former, you know, quite conservative British prime minister called Gaza an open air prison. There's nothing controversial about the reality of the just absolute, you know, brutality of Israeli policies towards Palestinians. This is just, you know, balls and strikes stuff. Corona 
in, as we say, in Gaza, essentially a, a, you know, a, a prison that is designed to limit uh, humanitarian aid, designed to, in the words of one Israeli general, keep them on a diet. West Bank, um, you know, more freely inside the context of a wall, and then also with evolving dynamics because, you know, uh, Jewish settlers are facilitated in, you know, ongoing kind of theft of Palestinian land. You know, I, I just want to note, I don't think there's much analysis or surprise here, but obviously a pandemic outbreak in that context, just as in the context of a brutal civil war with every faction committing war crimes in Syria, uh, or just a kind of basic underfunded administrative state as in Iraq, uh, well, in an occupation, apartheid, and, you know, economic stranglehold, corona cannot be good as we talk Israel-Palestine. Yeah, I mean, I don't, uh, uh, I, you know, Israel has gone on to a very severe, serious lockdown. Right. But, you know, like a place like Gaza is social distancing really practical. We've had this discussion within the context of the United States. Social distancing is a middle class luxury. You know, if you are, if you are poor, uh, if you are, if, or if you're living in packed and cramped circumstances, your ability uh, to social distance and take the personal measures you need to do to protect yourself from this in, in, uh, disease are extremely limited. I mean, you know, Gaza is a big example of this sort of uh, population all crushed together. But, you know, we can make this argument about, you know, you know, prison populations across the Middle East. I mean, Iran... And the United States. <laughs> yeah, and the United States. I mean, just as in the United States, Iran and Turkey have huge prison populations. Uh, Turkey and, and Iran have actually been sweeping up people more, you know, recently, I mean, before the coronavirus broke out. You know, now we have a situation where you're having riots in Iran, Iranian prisons. The Iranian government is releasing people but keeping political prisoners. In Turkey, they've had, th there's a recent law which uh, made it so that 100,000 people could be released. But the exception was people, political prisoners and people on pre-trial detention. So people on Which remand, Bill Barr wants here. <laughs> yeah. So basically, people who have not even been commit, convicted of a crime are the ones, and many of those are political prisoners, are kept in these very dangerous uh, conditions and circumstances. So, you uh, know, Gene, can you actually take a minute because I I want to in the last couple of minutes about uh, about oh. Turkey but specifically, but can you as a as a doorway to that actually talk specific and and again just to renote that what is already an absolute international obscenity, the U.S. Uh, you know, support for Israeli policy in West Bank and Gaza is going to be the, the toll in Gaza, just as the you know, ongoing Israeli bombardment and abuse of Gaza is going to be absolutely abhorrent. But in Turkey, can you talk specifically, we've talked a little bit about this, about the, the, uh, the Turkish Democratic Party, the, the uh, social democratic forces and the Kurdish uh, uh, party in Turkey, um, that not only were advocating for, you know, civil uh, equity for, for Kurds in Turkey, but also really pioneering this basic sort of Kurdish social, you know, sort of Middle Eastern social democracy in a very important way. Let's just, can we talk specifically about those political prisoners representing that party in Turkey? And then, and then more broadly, I mean, sure. I is mean, this a threat to Erdogan's grip? So, uh, you know, speaking specifically about sort of the Kurdish issue, repression throughout the coronavirus has continued. So there's been, uh, following the local elections, there's been a move before corona uh, to remove elected Kurdish mayors across uh, the Kurdish region of Turkey. And that has continued. I mean, I think like a week ago, they just released, relieved eight more mayors and have continued to imprison people. So even after you're having uh, sort of, criminals being evacuated from the prison, you know, you're also having new people brought in on political charges. So repression against the Kurds has continued, and not just against the HDP, you know, that's an ongoing thing, but the JHP, the, the main opposition party, you know, uh, the government has moved to, you know, those, those the uh, JHP controls important um, uh, local governments in big cities, including Istanbul, has moved to shut down uh, fundraising efforts of those groups to help people with corona. So the Turkish government has not let up on this sort of authoritarian trend. And, you know, Turkey, and we've talked about this, we've written about this, you know, there are parallels with the United States. You know, Turkey has 
compared to the United States taken, you know, taken actions sort of more seriously at certain points of this crisis. They were very early to uh, stop flights from Iran. Um, but of course, Erdogan's big sort of selling point be, uh, it has been the economy. So all these efforts that the Turkish government have sort of, t- uh, you know, taken in order to sort of mitigate uh, uh, the crisis have been tempered by a desire to keep the economy ticking over. Turkey does not have the wealth of the United States to just print money uh, to, uh, to do this. So there's, uh, you know, you have a couple of days ago, I checked and there were 40,000 cases in Iran, uh, in Turkey officially. Now there are 70,000 and, you know, deaths are approximately about 100, but people believe that the number could be a lot higher. Uh, we're seeing, we're seeing, you know, there are arguments to say that the government is fudging the statistics on how many people are dying of corona. Because, you know, if you don't test them, how do you know they died of corona? So they're not included in, in, in the uh, statistics. And just as the Trump administration seeks to deflect responsibility, we see Erdogan's administration seeking to defect to deflect responsibility for the spread of the virus. So blaming people, saying, well, you know, people need to go into voluntary quarantine. Why are people going to the countryside? You know, uh, uh, and at the same time, just as Trump does going, well, people in other countries have it a lot worse than us. Well, at the same time, you know, over 400 people have been arrested for posting about coronavirus. So there's sort of an attempt to suppress information while at the same time to tell people that everything, uh, you know, p- places in other countries are a lot better. Uh, you know, and we're even seeing sort of what I suspect, and I don't have evidence, is paid propaganda in the American press. If you check The Hill, yeah. there's a ridiculous article, and this is not the first time we've seen Turkish propaganda. If you remember Flynn's weird article in The Hill, uh, yeah. an article saying Turkey is a critical. Um, uh, uh, sort of ally in the fight against Corona. Now that is not for the consumption of the American audience. That is for the consumption of the Turkish audience so that the Turkish press can go, look, even foreign publications are telling us how good we're doing in dealing with these things. So this is for Turkey, a PR, uh, you know, a, a PR issue, an issue about eco- economics because Trump, uh, Turkey's economy was already stagnating. Corona is going to make things even worse. We're talking about, you know, there are going to be millions of people uh, unemployed, and there's already discontent. So there's this attempt to deflect blame, uh, while at the same time, you know, engaging in political repression and also enacting some uh, sort of uh, restrictions, restrictions of movements in big cities. Uh, you know, there, there are restrictions of moving between provinces and so on and so forth. So Turkey too, you know, we have this kind of authoritarian tendency uh, and this uh, sort of, I don't, you know, like this sacrifice everything for the economy, sort of Aztec capitalism, that the market demands the sacrifices, that um, that really undermines this response. For example, they've just sort of uh, relieved restrictions on curfews to young people, people under 20, because the idea is they're young and healthy, they can go out and work, uh, which is just, you know, really counterproductive. So, you know, across the Middle East, you know, authoritarianism, in a general sense, sectarianism, are really undermining the responses uh, to Corona. And, you know, not to mention conspiracy theories. You know, you know, America has its conspiracy theories. Uh, Iran, you know, the, the people are saying, oh, this is an American biological warfare plot against the United, uh, United States. Or in Turkey, there are people going, this is an effort to undermine Turkey becoming a superpower and things like right. that. So, there's a whole, uh, you know, authoritarianism, sectarianism, conspiracy thinking. It, it, it undermines the response and social solidarity at these times. Right. Exactly. And uh, look at the look at the dynamics of these places uh, and think to yourself: Is this the future you want to chart uh, as uh, as you look at the you know the arguments put forward uh, in this neo populism that we see from Hungary to Israel, from the United States to Brazil? It's in action uh, in in a lot of the Middle East, unfortunately, uh, with obvious you know support of its Western partners, and something we want to undermine. Uh, I don't think we want to to import it. Uh, Jean Bajlan, thank you so much as always. Stay safe, stay healthy. All the best to everybody out there. You too, and uh, you guys also stay. Safe. It's great talking to you again. Great talking to you, brother. Thank you. Bye.